just be reminded that the purpose of these examples that we are building, specifically the small factory, is not to end up with a very realistic model, but instead to demonstrate the, some of the blocks that are available in any logic and also some of the functionality that is available and how to actually plug some of this together. In this video, we're going to introduce new custom agents with their own custom animation. And we do this if we do not necessarily want to use those bright colored smarty dots, which are associated with the standard default agent. And then we will end this lecture with adding some statistical graphs in terms of tracking the utilization of, of our resource pool. So you can create your agent types in a number of ways. You can either select your small factory, go to your menu bar and say new agent type, or you can simply right click on small factory and say new agent type. So we're going to introduce five in the end, but for now just three, one for the body, one for the door, and one for the assembly. So I'm going to create the agent type name, body. I want to create it from scratch. And we will use the agents in the flowchart, not as resource units or material items or transporters, but as normal entities flowing through the process flowchart. I click Next. You can have a look at what animation is available, both in 2D and 3D. I'm going to ignore it because I want to draw my own. Next, we're going to add our parameters at a later point, and I'm just going to say Finish. So you end up with a new model space. And if you want to draw your own animation, it is important that you just note that this origin at the coordinate 0, 0 is what will be associated with the, let's call it the center point of your agents. So if I want to draw my own custom animation, I'm just going to move that out of the way, go to my palette, to the presentation tab, and drag a rectangle to my model space. And I'm going to leave the name default rectangle, leave the color at this point um, standard as well. Now I want to change the size and the scaling, so I'm dragging my ruler that is available in each agent type, dragging it to the width of the body and then make sure that the ruler length corresponds to the length that I actually want, which is going to be one meter. And now whenever my model runs and it visualizes the body, it will make sure that given the scaling of the main model, the bodies will be scaled correctly as well. Now I'm going to add at this point in time a parameter just to make my life simpler I use the parameter prefix and I'm going to call it width I want to set the default value to be the width of this rectangle that I've just drawn and I'm I'm doing this so that in the main model, it will be easier to call the width of the agent. At this point, it's going to be fixed. It's not going to change from one agent to the next, but you could add a random component to the width and make it a variable, for example. So the default value here is to actually get the scale. Now, I've toyed around with this in the past, so this is kind of just for you to learn. Method for this agent body that I can actually get the scale object, right? So, and if you have a look at the documentation with it, it tells me that this method returns the scale used by the space of this agent. The default scale is 10 pixels per meter. Now, so now I know that I get the scale of this object. If I press dot, I can actually either get the pixels per unit value, so I've retrieved my, my scale, but I want to convert this 
scale to length units. And as you can see, this takes two arguments. It takes the length in pixels, and it takes an object of type length units. So I'm going to call that method, and I now need to provide it with its two arguments. The first argument is the pixels that I want to convert, and here I'm interested in the rectangle, and if you recall, I've kept the name to be rectangle, so I'd start typing, I press control space, and the second option is my rectangle. If I press dot, I can see what methods do I have, have available for that object. And I can get the center, I can get the full color, I can get a variety of things. The one that I'm interested in is the width. And because it's a, uh, a square, I can actually get the, the height. So that's the pixels that I, that I want to convert. And the length units to which I want to convert this is, I'm going to start typing that object class name, length units, which is an object that is within the AnyLogic um, engine. It is the standard AnyLogic length unit, so that's the class. If you remember an earlier lecture that we had on basics of, of Java in AnyLogic, when we talked about inheritance and classes, uh, AnyLogic has got its own built-in classes in this regard, so I'm calling this in enum, which is just a fixed set of different length units. And if I press dot, you'll see that I have a bunch of standard ones that were already defined by AnyLogic. And I want to convert my pixels of the rectangle into meters. So if I just expand this so you can get an idea of the whole expression, that is the value of my parameter called width get scale, which I then convert to length units. And the value that I'm converting is rectangle.getWidth, and the units to which I want to convert it is length units.meter. Now let's go back to our main model and actually make our bodies look like the new bodies that we've created. So when I, want, when I generate new bodies, and I expand the property section of agent, you'll see that new agents are being defined, and the type of agent that we're creating used to be the default agent. But if I click on the drop-down box, any logic now picks up that I've created a new agent type. So whenever this source block creates new entities. I don't want them to create the standard agents. I want them to create my bodies that I've just added. I'm not going to change the dimensions because I've already invested the effort to do the scaling inside the body. So now bodies are created and bodies are being pushed into this process flowchart and they go into the, the queue. And you will now see that when I expand one of these advanced tabs, the agent type associated with this queue is now identified automatically as being bodies. And so to the conveyor type. It picks up that the agent type is body. Now, in order for our bodies to move on the conveyor without bumping into one another, you will recall that we uh, activated the change agent length and we said that the agent length was one meter. But now we know that our bodies also are exactly one meter in size. So instead of hard coding it in the main model, I want the agent length to be taken from the actual entity. Now at this point it may be worth just highlighting in the process 
modeling library if we hover over a conveyor, for example, and we open the help article, and this is available for all the blocks. If I scroll down to my actions area, on enter, on full enter, the description here tells me that on enter will be the code that is executed when the agent starts entering the conveyor. What is valuable is that there is a local variable which will be called agent, which is the current agent that is actually triggering this code to be executed. Right? So the local variable is called agent, and I can actually call that agent. So I can start typing ag control space and then it lists my agent as one of the first items in the list and it also identifies that this agent is of type body. So that's the agent that I'm interested in and you'll see that if I press dot and I press control space I get all of the methods and op uh, variables and objects that are available within this agent and there you see that I can actually get the width. Now I've already set up the width to, um, to have a default value, but I would be able to actually call the scale and do the conversion here in the main model. But instead I'm just going to call the width. So now the length that an agent takes up on the conveyor, that a body takes up the conveyor, is actually taken from a parameter that resides not here in the main model, but back in the body itself. And to give them a little bit of space, I'm just going to say that the size, the agent length as it appears here on the conveyor will be two times its width, which means every body will have half its size um, as, as a buffer on the one side and half its size as a buffer on, on the other side. Right, so let's see if this actually does something useful for us. I'm going to save my model. And let's just check our assembler block before we run it. If I go to the advanced section, I see that my assembler block also picks up that the first input connector, the agent type of one, is no longer the general agent, but it actually is a body. And that is what I would have expected. So, if I save the model, I build it successfully, no compilation errors, I'm ready to run my model. And here you see now that the animation has actually changed. There's a little bit more gap between my entities, and the entities now look like bodies as I've animated them. We kind of run out of doors here, so we can't really visualize them, but there we see that the assembly that's taking place inside the assembler still looks like the smarty dots, because we haven't changed that animation yet. So by just changing the agent type and associating an animation, a custom animation with it, it is reflected in our main model's animation as well. Now, at this point, I just need to fix something, and that is that in the source doors, I initially, I think in the first video, said that the inter-arrival time um, is defined, or the arrivals are defined by an inter-arrival time, and that follows a distribution with a lambda parameter 0 0.25. But actually what I want here is a mean inter-arrival time of 2.5 minutes. And this actually is slightly different. This equates to a lambda parameter of 0 0.4 and not 0 0.25 as I had it initially. So let me just fix that. I think there was a comment in a previous video that I added about that as well. So that's now sorted. Let's save the model and it should now be a little bit more balanced. So we created the body, now let's go ahead and let's create the door. I'm 
again going to right click new oops right click new there it is agent type and now I want to create an agent type door and you will note that using good programming or Java naming conventions my class name which is an agent type is actually a class uh, I use a capital letter I want to create the agent from scratch again I will use the agent in a flowchart as an agent and not as one of the other items I'm not going to associate any animation with a door and I'm not going to add any parameters it ends up with a new blank page for me so let's give our door an animation or associate it with a circle but in this case I want the appearance to have a full color of kind of let's say a golden yellowish and what I want to do is I want to set the width now so I draw extend my ruler and make sure that my ruler corresponds to 0. Point, let's make it 0. 0.6 meters All right so even though I've drawn it roughly about the same size as the body I now use the scale object to say but this is not 10 meters this is actually 0. 0.6 meters from from end to end I'm not going to add a parameter here I'm going to just save my model and go back to my main model in my source doors I'm now going to tell it to create new agents not of type default agent but a door the queue doors if I have a look at my advanced section now also deals with an agent type door and the assembler block will now automatically also pick up that the agent type on its second import is a door so if I save this model, build it, no compilation errors. I still don't seem to have any buildup of doors, so it's hard to actually see what my doors look like because I keep using them up before they are actually visualized. Let's just speed this up. Unfortunately, still nothing to, to see. Right, so with this random seed, it seems that we always have, or at, for, a, for a large portion of the model, have more bodies than what we actually have doors available. All right, but if you toy around with the arrival rates, you will actually see that your doors are, are actually arriving. They're just consumed immediately. Now, the final agent type that we're going to create is the assembly so I'm going to right click new agent type call it an assembly and again I'm going to create it from scratch associate it with the flowcharts not assign any animation and not add any parameters so I'm going to just finish and now I'm ready to draw my assembly and I'm going to again draw the rectangle that represents the body and then I'm going to add a circle that represents the door <clears throat> I 
And at this point, I am not going to add the width parameter again. So I can save this model, go to main, and in my assembler, this is where the assembly actually starts. Um, I want the new agent type that is created by the assembler to now not create a default agent for me, but when the assembly actually is, is generated to create this new assembly type for me. And I actually see here that here is another way. There was a link down here, a hyperlink that actually allowed me to create new entity types even from here. And again, I've scaled my object, mind you, I actually have not scaled my object. Let's save, go back to our assembly. And just drag that and make sure that the ruler now corresponds to one meter. Right, so if I save this model, build it, You will now see that the new entities that are being created in the assembler changes its animation shape from the general agent type, which is the smarty dot, to the assembly that we've just created. Next, I want to add a plot to my model. And you can have a look at the different charts that are available in the help function. There are bar charts. The one that I'm going to add at this point is a time plot. And let me just expand the properties here. I'm going to add two bits of, of data. The first one is going to be the number of busy units. And the value here, the purpose of, of this plot for me is going to just have a look while the model is running at the utilization of my resource pool, which is called resource assembler. So I start by calling that block resource assembler control space and there it picks it up. So I select it from the, from the list. And if I press control space dot control space, I can see what values and methods do I actually have available inside, inside my, inside the block. And I see that here I have a method called busy, and this returns the number of busy units, including those that are in a wrap up, maintenance, break, or failure stage. So I'm going to visualize that. This will be a real time. So as the model is, is running, I will be able to up, see updated values of how many of my resource units are being busy. I'm going to add a second, uh, data element to my plot. And this one I'm going to call utilization. And here I'm going to convert the average utilization to, instead of working with the percentage of the utilization, I'm going to just convert that to the actual capacity. So what, what percentage of my eight people are on average working? So again, I'm going to call my assembler, oops, now I've lost my value there. Let's just repeat that. That was the resource assembler dot busy. And here I want to call my resource assembler dot, if I look for utilization,
it ret uh, the return value is the mean over all the individual uh, unit utilizations calculated from the most recent reset stat score up to the current time. So unless I reset my statistics during the model runtime, this will be over the entire model runtime period. So this will give me a utilization value between zero and one, and I can now multiply this by the number of units that is available in my pool. And this you can find in your resource assembler dot capacity. Right, so that tells you the number of units, the, the total available capacity. So if I multiply the capacity with the utilization, I get a running tally of the average number of units that are fizzy. And you can change with the look and feel of that. Let's just save the model, check that we haven't got any compile issues, and let's run this and see what it actually looks like. I can see as expected that the number of units are oops, control. <coughs> the number of units changes stepwise while the utilization, the gray value, is actually a little bit more smooth because it calculates the mean utilization. So if I just click one, it will kind of hide or bring that one to the front, and if I select the other one, it will kind of just highlight one, especially if I have multiple units or multiple data uh, plots on my, on my chart. In this case, it always runs between zero and six. If I speed this up, I will actually see that the scale changes on this side, on the, on the y-axis, and if I want to, I can go back and actually just change the data update in terms of how frequently should it update. I can change the scale, and I can make the vertical scale fixed to make sure that it runs from zero to eight. if I want that value to be eight right from, from the start. All right, so you can add charts and data depending on what you want to visualize. Later in the course, we will actually see how it is possible to get the data out of these charts and out of your model into a file that you can actually analyze at a later stage.